Our guest preacher this morning is Rob Sims. Uh, Rob is a longtime staff member with Young Life uh, in the Kent area for a long time, was the area director, and now has moved to being the associate regional director. Uh, Rob and his wife, Cindy, are longtime members of KCC. There's just a little bit of information about them in the bulletin. But uh, their kids, Casey, is a sophomore at Washington State University, and Braden is a sophomore, oh, at Eastern Washington? Oh, thank you for that correction. She's an eagle, not a cougar. All right, and uh, Braden is a sophomore at Kentwood. I did get that right, didn't I? You are at Kentwood, okay. And it's going to start off with Braden reading the scripture. So come on, Braden. We're glad to have you reading the scripture for us today. Thank you, Keith. Please stand if you are capable for the reading of God's word. Our first reading comes to us from Malachi, book 3, verse 1. Look, I am sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to the temple. The messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so e eagerly, is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Our next reading comes to us from the book of John. In the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God, and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Let the word of God find purchase in your hearts this morning. You may be seated. The more times that Keith used the word long time as he was talking about me, the older I felt. <laughs> Raise your hand if you love, I mean love, to wait. Any masochists in the room? So a few days ago, I'm making my way up the hill, James Hill, to get up here. And as I got towards Showware Center, all of a sudden, a showware official came out and stopped all of us that were traveling towards the hill. And I don't know what was going on there, but the mass of people that were walking from the park and ride across the street over to showware was so significant that I turned off my car. Long, long, I had somewhere I kind of needed to get to. I was early, so I wasn't, I wasn't that worried yet. Because then when I finally got to go, and you know what's coming, the lights start flashing and the gate comes down because there's a train coming through. And I thought, well, I hope it's the sounder. I hope it's the sounder because those sounders are kind of short. No, it was a freight train, a long freight train. And I'm waiting and I'm watching the clock and I, I, I hate being late. I hate it. My, my dad instilled in me this, this deep desire to be early for things and not late. And so I'm, I'm feeling it. So I'm planning ahead. I'm thinking, do not, you can't go in the left lane when you're going up James Hill, because if someone turns left, you could sit there a while. You know what I'm talking about? So I get over in the right lane, but of course, there's a big, huge Fred Meyer truck carrying some stuff to the Fred Meyer at the top of the hill, so I chance it. I pop over into the left lane, and I'm scooting, blink, 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 and there I'm sitting, and I'm so frustrated. It took me almost 20 minutes to go less than a stinking mile. Raise your hand, raise your, your hand if you share the spiritual gift that my wife has, which is if you go grocery shopping at Safeway, QFC, wherever, you can always find the line that goes the slowest. You know what I'm talking about? So there she is yesterday. It happened again. She's standing in line, and while she's waiting, and, oh, can I, can I help the next person over here? And the lady behind her jumps over into that line. She gets through. All the way, she, Cindy's watching as there's a price check happening in front of her. <laughs> Watches this lady take her goods out to the car, 
make sure the dog doesn't get out of the car, strap in the kid, and go out of the lot, and she still hasn't gotten her turn up in line. Amazing what that gift is that God blessed her with. Praise God. Okay. How many of you remember the last trimester of pregnancy? The last trimester creeps along pretty slow. And then the due date arrives, and lo and behold, you're one of those people who's blessed with delivering after the due date. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait. Waiting is hard. Going to the doctor is the best, because they actually have a room designated for waiting, called the waiting room. Why they would plan for that, I don't know. And so you sit there, and you, you grab your magazine, and you pretend like you're reading it, but really you're looking around. I wonder what she has. I wonder why that guy's here. Ooh, he's got a good magazine. Maybe I'll get that if he chose me. But no, they say your name. So you set down your magazine, and you stand with pride. Kind of stick your chest out. <clears throat> I've been chosen. <laughs> and the nurse escorts you back into your little room where what happens there? You wait some more. Only now, you forgot your magazine. So you're reading pamphlets on appendectomies and all sorts of whatever you can find to pass the time. Absolutely brutal. Now sometimes, sometimes the waiting is hard because we know exactly what's coming. When I was a junior in high school, I was with my buddy Tim Patterson. And Tim had this job. He worked for his dad. Jack Patterson worked for the Ford Motor Company. And when all of the vehicles would come off the train, they'd park them in this huge parking lot. And then if there were extra options or different things that needed to be adjusted before they sent them to the dealers, they would handle that there. Well, Tim's job, once a week, is he would go and spend about an hour or two cleaning up the shop. So it would get dirty over the course of the week, so we'd sweep the floor, he'd clean up the grease stains, he'd clean the bathroom, he'd get things wiped down in the office spaces and all of that. That was his job. If we had a movie to go to or something to do, sometimes one of us would go help him. So I'm going to help Tim. And I go to help Tim, but when we get there, we realize something's different. There's no cars in the parking lot. It's just one huge piece of blacktop. And then we go into the shop, and there's only two vehicles in there. There's a van, a service van, and a Shelby Mustang. Two 17-year-old boys, Shelby Mustang, big empty parking lot. You do the math. We get everything cleaned up, and then we fire it up. And we take it out in the lot, and we're going as fast as we can in a straight line, and then we yank the emergency brake. We're doing donuts, but we've got a mo movie to get to, so we're not out there real long. We take the car, put it back in the shop, shut out the lights, lock it up, get out to the main gate. We're locking it up, and all of a sudden, woo, spotlights on us. Put your hands up on the fence. So, and my whole future is going down the toilet in one swift motion. I am panicked. Tim explains to the policeman that he was supposed to be there. Why were you driving the car? Got a vouch for you. He calls his dad. 20 minutes later, 20 minutes of waiting, 20 minutes of stress because I was Tim's good friend. Tim was always getting into trouble. I got into trouble here and there, but Jack was just hoping that I could steer Tim onto a good path. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the worst. And, and Jack Patterson shows up. And I, 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 he just looks at Tim and shakes his head. And then he looks at me and says, I, I couldn't be more disappointed. This is not who I thought you were, Rob. And he turns around. I'd rather he'd punched me. That is, those are the worst words to hear. Sometimes waiting is hard because the stakes are high. We had a, we had a friend not too long ago who had a lump. And so they did a, a biopsy. And the waiting for the results was, was a long, long time. That waiting was hard because the stakes were high. And the report came back clean. Praise God. Wonderful. But the bottom line is, we all struggle with patience. Waiting stinks. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Lord God, we want to hear from you. Open our minds. Open our eyes. Open our hearts to whatever specific thing is that you want to tell us this morning. We're open to that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, we have been going through the story over the past few months, walking through. We've walked, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a flood, King David, Esther, all this stuff. And last week, last week was that last, last little bit that's significant of Nehemiah completing God's temple in Jerusalem, 516 B. 
B.C. And Ezra, the prophet Ezra, leads a massive revival. And all God's people are, are just joined together and great things are happening. And they're following the Lord. And then for the next about 100 years, there's a few more minor prophets who continue to hear from God and speak to God's people. The last of which being Malachi, who around 400 B.C., lets us know, once again, that God's people have turned their back on his law. They're doing their own thing. But the Lord also tells us through Malachi that the big day is coming. The day that people Israel have been waiting for. The day of Emmanuel, which means God with us. The day of Messiah, which means Savior, Liberator, King. The great day of his arrival is coming. And then, then intermission. <laughs> there is, there's a long wait. The Bible is basically broken up into two parts. It's one story, but it's broken up into two parts. The Old Testament and the New Testament. And today we get to walk over the bridge that takes us from the old to the new. And that bridge is called the Great Wait. You see, the prophet Malachi, after he speaks, there's a pause. It's kind of like the calm before a storm. God is still present. God is still holding everything together. He's got the whole world, and you and me, brother, and you and me, sister, in his hands. Everything is moving forward. The sun rises and sets, the rain falls, but the canon of God's word, the holy scriptures, silently wait for the culmination of the prophecies, God's promise, the arrival of God with us, the king. Messiah Emmanuel. Malachi says he's coming, and then 400 years. 400 years of silence. No more prophets hearing and speaking from the Lord. 400 years of waiting, waiting, waiting. You know what was happening 400 years ago from today? There was a boat bobbing across the Atlantic full of pilgrims, the Mayflower. That's about 400 years ago. Let me, let me give you an idea of those 400 years between Malachi and Jesus. Because there were some significant things happening. And it gives you an idea of how long 400 years is. The Greek philosopher Socrates was philosophizing. China became an empire. That's a long time ago. Alexander the Great conquered everything in his path. The Silk Road was established between Europe and China. And, and this is a big one, the Roman Empire rose, became an empire, expanded, occupying more and more territory, including the Promised Land, Israel, making the Hebrew people, God's chosen people, once again, not free. They're paying taxes to the Romans, paying tributes, forced to do whatever the Roman authorities ask them to do. One of the things they'd have to do is they'd have to carry a Roman guard's gear for them for the prescribed amount of time. And it wasn't an option. You had to do it because you were subject to Rome. And through it all, they continued to lean expectantly on the prophecies of the coming of their king. For 400 years, the Israelites continued to wait for the Messiah. They waited, and they waited, and they waited. Do you remember as a child waiting for Christmas morning? Remember that wait? That's a whopper. What those weeks, those days leading up to it were like. Could they go any slower? And often we had an idea of what it was that we were waiting for. When I was in second grade, I wanted this. My parents are in the crowd today. They probably remember me wanting this. Evil Knievel action figure set. <laughs> I'd seen it on TV. I'd asked Santa for it. I talked with my mom about it. Neither my mom or Santa seemed to object. So I assumed Christmas morning when I walked out, there he would be in all his glory. Evil Knievel with the wind-up motor, the motorcycle, the ramps, the buses to jump over, the whole enchilada. So I waited, so excited, so excited. And Christmas morning never seemed to get any closer. Then after all that waiting, Christmas Eve finally arrived. But that's the worst part. You remember being a little kid trying to go to sleep on Christmas Eve? And you lay there and someone told you about counting sheep? That doesn't work. Some, someone says, just keep your eyes closed. That'll work. And you keep your eyes closed. Nothing. Nothing helps. Nothing. And you lay there expectantly in your bed, just hoping 
to go to sleep, or maybe stay up a little longer and hear Santa on the roof or something, but you can't go to sleep. It's absolutely brutal. In the second grade, all I could think about was this evil Knievel set, and during those 400 years of waiting for their prophesied king, the Israelites had a very clear picture of what it was that they were expecting. They were expecting, just as all the prophecies had pointed to, an anointed king who would do wonders, who would speak prophetically, who would bring relief and deliverance to Israel. This is exactly what old man Simeon and the woman Anna had been waiting for that you can read about in Luke 2. But the Israelites, they wanted something more. They added something, something in addition. It wasn't prophesied, but they added to it because that's what they wanted. You see, they were occupied and subject to the Roman Empire. So they had, in their minds, created a Messiah for their own purposes. They wanted a mighty leader who would free them from the Romans. So with hopes and dreams of political deliverance, and with the many prophecies of Scripture dancing in their heads, God's people await their Messiah. And then one day, things start happening. But not at all like people were expecting. 400 years of waiting, and then a surprising entrance. In the tiny town of Nazareth, a young, very young girl is visited by the angel Gabriel, who lets her know that she's about to be pregnant with the son of the Most High God. Her fiancé, after finding out she's pregnant, is pretty disappointed, plans to quietly break off the wedding, but then an angel of the Lord visits him and explains everything, and here we go. You know the story. The first Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, he calls for a census, and everyone's got to go back to their hometown. So Mary and Joseph, they head back to Bethlehem, where he was from. And when they get there, no vacancy. There's not a room to be found. It's cold. It's dark. And so the guy at the end, he, he sends them over to this cold, stinky barn in Podunk, Bethlehem. Now, friends, if you're going to start something right, if you're going to do it the right way, you're starting up a company, you're starting anything, location, location, location. You have got to start in the right place. It is absolutely important. Now, at this time, the place to start would be Rome, or at least Jerusalem, but not in nowhere Bethlehem. That's a bad choice, poor choice. Nobody would choose that. Never mind that the prophet Micah, in around 700 BC, had foretold that the Messiah would hail from Bethlehem. And it's true, God always gets his way every time. But the truth is this, there's not a single one of us in this room, there's nobody anywhere, who if they were thinking about starting something big, would start in Omak, Washington. That's not where you start. That's not what you do. But that's what Bethlehem is. It's the middle of nowhere. Even today, when people go and visit the Holy Lands, there's not a major highway that takes you right to Bethlehem. Bethlehem sits more than a mile off any highway. It's in the middle of nowhere. Why? Maybe it's just that God loves an overcomer. God loves an underdog. Maybe God was highlighting the fact that he was humbling himself, not just by leaving paradise and coming to earth, but by starting out in one of the most humble spaces possible, a barn in one of the most humble towns on earth. Against all odds, God chooses a shed in lowly Bethlehem for his birthplace. Unreal. And how about this? The second thing that you would want to do if you're going to start something right is you've got to make sure that you hobnob with the right people. You get connected. You, get, you start networking. You get linked in. So who does God lead to see the child first? A bunch of grimy, stinky, unconnected, dregs of society, shepherds. Bad choice. This is not how anyone was expecting the king to arrive. When I was in second grade on Christmas morning, finally got to sleep evidently, I woke up, I shook my parents, come on, let's go! And out to the family room we go. And there, by the fireplace, it wasn't. You ever had that expectation and you're just completely let down? I was so disappointed. 
so disappointed. Instead, there was sitting an electric guitar and an amplifier. At first, I was really confused. I'd taken four lessons, I knew about three chords. <laughs> I was not a real guitar player. And electric guitars and amplifiers, they're, they're, they're for the real people. I thought, Santa has no idea what he's doing. So I plugged it in, and like a good second grader, I turned it all the way up. <laughs> And I hit that first power chord. Ring! Woo! I was sold. Way better than I was expecting. Absolutely awesome. While Jesus may not have arrived in the exact manner that people were ex expecting, as you're going to see in the coming sermons, and I hope you'll keep coming back here and hear the rest of this story, Jesus was far more than advertised. A whole lot more. He claimed to be God, and he completely backed it up. He declared himself to be the prophesied Messiah, the one who was to come, and he did not disappoint. In fact, if anything, all those prophecies, they undersell who he actually was. He was fantabulous. One of Jesus' closest friends and followers, John, described Jesus like this. In the beginning, the Word already existed. Jesus predates time. The Word was with God. In fact, the Word was God. So the Word became human or flesh and made his home or dwelling among us. You can say it another way. You can say it like this. Before the world began and when the world began, Jesus was. He was right there. He was with God. He was God. God put skin on and moved into the hood. When I was in elementary school, I loved, loved the chili con carne and cornbread lunch. Never mind the after effects. I just loved the chili con carne. But I didn't know what the con carne was. What was that con carne thing all about? Well, carne, as I later learned, means meat or flesh. Incarnation. Jesus is the incarnation. God took on carne, flesh. Colossians puts it this way. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. God in the flesh. God in a bod. The incarnation. If you want to know what God is like, all you have to do is check out Jesus. You know, companies use logos to help us recognize them or their products so now it's quiz time for the crowd. We're going to put just a few little logos up on the screen. I want you out loud, in unison. If you don't know these, you might be from OMAC, but in unison, I want you to say these out loud. All right, here we go. Correct. Nice work. Way to go. Well done. That's how it goes. You know what you're doing. Way to go. You're awesome. You know everything. Well done. Even the last one was kind of, you know everything. Have I built you up enough? Okay, here we go. Jesus is God's logo. God in a bod. God fully revealed in the form of a man. Fully God, hear this one, fully God and fully man simultaneously. And because God became fully human, you know what that means? It means he understands. Jesus knows what things are like for you and us because he put on flesh and he lived out a life like you and I do. Experienced what we experience. He grew up experiencing all the things that you and I experience. He had parents. He had siblings. He had chores. He experienced abuse, joy, pain, laughter, disappointment, love. I think it's pretty amazing that God would choose to humble himself and live an ordinary life. Even though Jesus experienced some extraordinary things, as you'll see in the coming weeks, he's experienced things that no one else has ever experienced. Remember that he still experienced everyday, ordinary, normative human experiences that you and I experience. He knows exactly what you've gone through in your past, what you're going through right now, and he knows even what you're going to go through. No matter what you've experienced, no matter what you're currently experiencing, he's experienced everything we have. 
and he knows exactly how you feel. Friends, he knows loss, the death of a friend, frustration, hunger, stress, being abandoned, being betrayed, knowing he's going to die. As a 12-year-old boy, he went to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Remember the Passover feast? Remember the whole deal when they were enslaved and God's spirit came in and passed over their doorways because they'd painted the blood of the lamb on the door and they exited. God ushered them out of slavery and across, parted the Red Sea, that whole deal. The Passover. It's the greatest celebration in Jewish culture, even to this day. So they're going back to Jerusalem to do this celebration. And they do it. And then they're on their way home. And Joe and Mary realize, do we have all the kids? (laughs) Somebody's... Somebody's not here. And so they head back to Jerusalem, and it says for three whole days they searched for Jesus. When Braden was about three years old or so, we were at Disneyland. And we carried all our stuff on the stroller. He was, he was right there in the stroller. He didn't need to be in the stroller, but when you're three years old, it's a long walk for her. It'll tuck her out a little boy. So we got him in the stroller, and we're scooting along. We got all our stuff up on top, so you can't really see him in there. And as we got over towards the Pirates of the Caribbean, we go to get him out, and he's not there. <laughs> Panic. We are horrified. You're looking through the masses. We're calling for him. For 30 seconds, we had no idea. Fortunately, we dressed him in like bright red stuff because he's a wanderer. We thought this might happen. And we found him. 30 seconds was an eternity. I want you to imagine three whole days. They've got some more family there, so they've got all the family members looking everywhere they can. Where are the natural place? Where might he be? Where could he be for three whole days? And where'd they find him? They find him at church, talking with the teachers, talking with the people who know the law, who know the word of God. And as he's sitting there talking with them, they are astounded, astounded at the understanding that this 12-year-old boy had. For three whole days, the family looked for Jesus. And when they finally do find him, well, let's just say, Jesus knows exactly what it's like to have upset parents. How could you treat us this way? John the Baptist prepared people's hearts for his arrival, just as Malachi had prophesied. And now, though still young, Emmanuel, God with us, the king is here. The long-awaited Messiah has finally arrived. And I think it's pretty amazing that the innkeeper sees an extremely pregnant young girl, and he doesn't find a way to make sure that she's comfortable and taken care of. The innkeeper could have done better than a barn. Jesus wasn't even born yet, and he was already experiencing rejection. In John 1, verses 10 and 11, John explains how Jesus wasn't received as well as he ought to have been. Because, friends, the world is always too crowded to receive Jesus. Our lives are crowded with deadlines, headlines, phone lines, long lines, to-do lists, full schedules, jam-packed lives. We hate to wait because we feel like we're losing time, wasting time, pressed for time, not on time, out of time. But in the perfect time, I want you to follow me on this one, God entered into time. He who has no time entered into the time-space continuum, took on flesh, and dwelt among us. He did that so that we might have real life, the real thing. Not the fake life that we copy off the people around us, the real thing that he knitted us together in our mother's womb to have real life. Jesus didn't come to complicate our already complicated life. He came to simplify our life, to give us real life, more life, better life than you can dream of. Friends, it's never too late to invite Jesus into your life. We don't have to clean up our act first. He accepts us exactly the way we are. In fact, if that notion crosses our minds, I I, I gotta fix, I gotta get rid of this thing or I gotta add this thing, I gotta do this thing before I can go to God, you know what he says? No, don't. Because you know what happens when we try to fix things? We screw them up worse. He says, just come just as you are right now. 
come to me. And with open arms, he accepts us. It wasn't too late for Abraham at 100 years of age. It wasn't too late for Moses after 40 years in the desert. It wasn't too late for Jonah when he ran away from God. It wasn't too late for Saul who persecuted and killed Jesus' followers. It wasn't too late for Peter who denied Jesus. It wasn't too late for Thomas who doubted Jesus. It's not too late for you to meet Jesus, the King and our Savior. He comes to common folk like you and me, a common carpenter, a common little virgin girl, a common shepherd. When God shows up, he shows up through common things. And the sooner we start walking with Jesus, the sooner real life gets rolling. Friends, there's nothing complicated about this. There was a, a young girl who lived with her mom just outside of the big city in Brazil. And they had a great relationship, but as a lot of moms and daughters do, they got into those teenage years, and there started to be a butting of heads. I don't want to do that. Individuation. And so the daughter got everything she had together. In the middle of the night, she took off, ran away. She figured she'd be a barista. She figured she'd find a job somewhere, be easy in the big city. There's always jobs in the city. But it was a little trickier than she thought. And so the only thing she could do to get some food in her stomach was to sell her body. And she was so ashamed of what she was doing that she started using drugs to try and mask the pain. Well, her mom never forgot her. And so she took a picture that she knew her daughter would recognize. It was a little picture when she was about four or five years old in a ballerina outfit. And they both loved that picture. And she took it, and she wrote something on the bottom of it, and then she went and made copies of it, a bunch of copies. And she started putting it all over town, on the side of this building, on that doorpost, on that stop sign, anywhere and everywhere. She put this sign, hoping that her daughter was in that town, and that at some point she would see it. And then, on a clear morning, the daughter came out after a rough night, and on the side of the building, she saw this picture. And she went over to it. And all it said is, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've gone, I love you. Come home. When we go home to God, we don't get a speech. Well, you really screwed up there. We don't get judgment. All we experience is a huge smile and open arms to enfold us. He just wants each of us to come home. Whether you don't know God and you're ready to come home, or whether there's some little things going on in your life and you've been running away from God and you're ashamed, he just wants you to come home. He wants to give you real life, more life, better life than you can possibly have living on your own apart from God in little ways or big ways. He just wants you home. Your daddy wants you home. I'm going to pray, and if you want to pray along with me to come home to God in a small way or in a big way, just silently pray this alongside me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have run from you. We've been living on our own all together, or maybe we've been living on our own in a way that's very specific. I thank you that you don't judge me. I thank you that you accept me exactly as I am. I'm not going to try to fix anything. I'm just coming home. I thank you that you're going to walk with me at a pace I can handle. You're not going to give me too much, and you're always going to be there for me. So God, I want to come home, and I want to walk with you in relationship. Thank you that you've done everything to make that possible. I'm going with you. In Jesus' name, amen.